Hello again, YouTube. Welcome to the Card Combo Show with me, Chokabilly, where we look at the weird and wonderful card combinations in the Final Fantasy TCG. And this week we're looking at cards that you can count on. Get it? Anyway, cards. Uh, Omega, because he's fun. <laughs> uh, Edge. Aledna. Goblin. And Garnet. So, a mixed bag there. Right, Omega. At the end of each player's turn, if there is no weapon counter placed on Omega, place one weapon counter on Omega. If one or more weapon counters are placed on Omega, Omega deals your opponent one point of damage and remove all weapon counters from Omega instead. When Omega is chosen by your opponent, summons or abilities, you may remove one weapon counter from Omega. If you do so, Omega gains. Omega can be broken until the end of the turn. Jesus, that's a mouthful. So yeah, he's quite powerful because basically with every passing of two turns, he deals your opponent, uh, uh, your opponent a point of damage, which is really good. Not to mention the fact that he can also sack one of his counters off just to save himself. So yeah, strong. Also a fun point of note is that his category, it's category, not category, uh, it is a special card, which basically means it can be used in titles, which isn't something I've ever really addressed in these uh, episodes. Um, but yeah, basically it means that you could have just a Final Fantasy 5, 10, 13 deck, and Omega can slot in there nice and easy, which is horrible. Anyway. Necron. You can play two or more dark characters on the field. When Necron enters the field, choose one character other than Necron you control. Its enemy becomes dark at the end of each of your turns. If your opponent, if you control, sorry, three or more dark characters, Necron deals your opponent one point of damage. So, if you've got Omega, Necron, and then two other dark characters on the field, let's go with, I don't know, the Chaos back up, and then whatever Necron made dark, it means that alternating turns from your turn and your opponent's turn, you're dealing your opponent a point of damage. Now, obviously, that's probably... <laughs> Neither of these cards are going to stay on the field for very long when you get to play them. But if your opponent can't get rid of them then and there, that's a big problem because, you know, that's a point of damage per turn, which is hilarious. And if you can set up the appropriate protection in place, having things like Charlotte and Summon Mitigation, your opponent's got a lot of trouble coming at them fast. Sophie, similar sort of theme. So obviously if you've got enough earth and water cards or forwards on the field, Sophie gets 10,000 power. You can start ticking points of damage to your opponent as well. Similar to Necron, Sophie's generally easier to get to though because you can just have, I think, Sarah from Mobius and then like any water or earth after that. But it basically means that again, alternating turns, you're ticking a point of damage onto your opponent and your opponent's not going to know which one to go for. Do they go for Sophie? Do they go for Omega? Or do they go for the forward that's buffing Sophie? You know? And then something like Tama. So now this is interesting because obviously you can have Omega um, come onto your opponent's field in their turn, which actually means that if you've got Sophie and Omega on your field and Sophie's high enough power to deal your opponent a point of damage, you can at the end of your turn deal your opponent two points of damage. Um, provided Sophie meets her requirements and Omega has enough counters on him. What's also interesting is the fact that you will also have on your turn the counter to be removed to make it so that Omega can't be broken. So if you wanted to combo that into something as well on your turn, you could. Uh, but ultimately, yeah, you can have two points of damage dealing to your opponent at the end of your turn every turn. If you really want to throw Necron in here as well, you could. I don't know why you would. I mean, trying to deal three points of damage to your opponent every turn. I mean, that's something to aim for and would be hilarious, but I don't know how viable it really is. All right, Sid Randall and Aerith. So this is based on a deck that I currently have, which is basically stop your opponent from doing anything. But the problem with that is that cards like Sid Randall and other cards that complement him aren't very powerful in their own right. They're powerful in this respect that they stop your opponent from doing much, but their power themselves is pretty small. Um, I need something like... Uh, Remedy, who's only a 7k forward as well, to buff Sid Randall. So realistically, you've got a lot of forwards on your field that stop your opponent from doing a lot of things, but they aren't very big and you don't have much power to push through with that. So having something like Omega sat there, constantly ticking a point of damage on your opponent every couple of turns, is pretty good. Spiritus. So just being able to play the Spiritus to then search the Omega to play onto the field, that's just really good anyway. But also Spiritus is a form of protection for Omega as well, because... Uh, provided Omega doesn't have a counter on it, it means that if your opponent does get rid of Omega, you can then remove a forward deck control with Spiritus. And, you know, you could also use Spiritus with Tama on your opponent's turn to then search Omega, which would, again, be quite funny. Naja Salahim. Now, this is a bit strange because obviously your opponent, or uh, using Naja to give Omega 
an additional counter is a bit strange because when Omega ticks over the end of a turn and he has a counter, he removes all counters from him. But if you're able to get Omega onto your field on your opponent's turn, it means that during your turn, you can actually attack with Narja's Halahim and increase Omega's counters by one, or double it technically, so it goes from one to two. Um, which then means you can remove one of those counters to make it so that Omega cannot be broken. You can combo that with something if you want, or if you really wanted to, you can just attack, you know, and remove a counter so it can't be broken. There's lots of different ways you can combo it, but ultimately you would need to have Omega on your, um, come onto the field on your opponent's turn for Narja to be able to actually increase the counters on Omega. Um, which is a bit weird really, but you know, it's there and it exists. Edge. So he's a 2 CP wind ninja with 5k power. The cost required to play your job ninja or card name ninja onto the field is reduced by one and can be paid with CP of any element. A uh, point of note there is the fact that it doesn't say um, is reduced by one but cannot become zero. So you can make your ninjas become zero with other abilities if you want or just have one CP um, and then just become zero because that's hilarious. When a job ninja or a card name ninja other than Edge enters your field, place one shuriken counter on Edge, remove one shuriken counter from Edge, choose one forward, deal 3k damage. So I've come up against this um, deck more times than I would like and it can accelerate fast because obviously it reduces the cost of the backups as well as the forwards which means and they can be played for any cp uh, any element sorry so they just kind of come out of nowhere which is what you would expect of ninjas anyway um something like manasvin warmech might be quite decent because this means you only have to play two ninjas to get uh two counters on edge you pay the one fire for management and now you can deal 10k to something which is pretty simple and you know again edge reduces cost of things so you can play just literally for free to one cost um, ninjas onto the field and then pay the one five for management you dealt 10k something well technically 5k twice but you know the hooded man so um hooded man when into the field choose one category four forward other than the card name hooded man in your break zone add it to your hand and at the end of each of your turns activate all the category four forwards you control so that's a lot of ninjas actually so you've got edge <laughs> let's test my uh, knowledge here edge <laughs> i've literally forgotten all their names um but yeah a lot of the ninjas are category four cards and they you know, just reactivating them at the end of your turn, really good. Getting them from your break zone to then play them on the cheap, really good. Hooded Man, I think, in a ninja deck is just an auto-include, to be honest. What are they called? I've got to remember at least one of them. Uh, go Setsu? I don't know. <laughs> uh, Tilika. So... Tilika's ability does state that a um, when a character's cost is reduced by one, but it cannot become zero. So you need to be mindful of this because if you do have two CP ninjas, they will still only be one CP, which means you effectively wasted a backup. But it does mean that your three CP and four CP ninjas do get reduced by two CP. So if you've got lots of those in your deck that you want to play, probably run something like Tilika. You could also run something like Stan Leonis, uh, but I went for Tilika just because it reduces the characters as well. So it's including the backups so if you do have, you know, three or four CP ninja backups, they become super cheap as well. Warrior of Light. So when a job standard unit forward enters your field to choose up to two backups, activate them. So uh, most ninjas that aren't, well, every ninja that isn't named um, is a standard unit. So you play it onto the field and it's on the cheap because of edge. So let's say it becomes two CP. Warrior of Light's there. Just reactivate your backups and you just keep on playing them. Um, again, the edge making them, you know, colorless means that you can just keep on playing it doesn't matter what backups you reactivate you don't have to worry about the way you're paying for things because they're colorless it's just they just swarm it's horrible uh Luneth, you know they reactivate your backups why not give them haste as well i just oh i hate ninjas man <laughs> Uh, and then the backup ninja. So what I was talking about earlier. So when ninja enters the field, choose one forward. You control and return to its owner's hand. If you do so, you may play one forward and that costs one CP more than it from your hand onto the field. So let's say hypothetically you've used Tilaka and you've got Edge. You play a three CP ninja for one CP onto the field. 
Uh, maybe you've got the Warrior of Light to reactivate backups as well. Who knows? Um, but then you can play Ninja for 2 CP. You can bounce that 3 CP back to your hand to then play a 4 CP onto the field. Obviously, you only really want to do that if you're gaining some sort of entry ability. But, you know, there's lots of those with Ninjas. Not to mention the fact that Edge is also gaining uh, counters from this as well. So, yeah, being able to play this dude for even just 3 CP to get something bigger onto the field is really good. And finally, Ewan, because he isn't a ninja, but definitely feels like one. He's only 1 CP, but ultimately you can have just one counter on edge, sling it at someone, play Ewan for 1 CP, you killed it. Pretty good. It's less a, a ninja, more an assassin. Uh, Lednar. So when Lednar enters the field due to your cast, place a 1 fortune counter on Lednar. Now, don't uh, get that misinterpreted. Yes, he might have cast Phoenix, and that is the reason he Lednar's coming onto the field, but what it actually means is that you have cast Lednar. If you have cast Lednar, then he gains a counter. If you've cast something that plays Lednar onto the field, it doesn't count, I'm afraid. Um, if a fortune counter is placed on Lednar, Lednar cannot be broken. Discard two cards, remove all fortune counters from Lednar. Each player can use this ability. Now, Lednar's very unique because of that ability. So technically, you could have Lednar and your opponent could have the Opus 2 Emperor and they wouldn't be able to discard because Lednar's ability doesn't work. It's bonkers. Um, but also, you know, your opponent can discard too and you can react to that as well. So, something like Green Mage. Dull, put Green Mage into the break zone, choose one action ability, cancel its effect. So your opponent has discarded two and he's break a backup and Lednar keeps his counter and he's hard to kill. You've basically just broken a backup to make your opponent discard two. Pretty decent. Uh, Luge, when a forward enters your field, you may remove Luge from the game. If you do so, that forward gains plus 2,000 power and brave. So Lednar at 10k with brave that cannot be broken and your opponent has to discard two to even send a chance of breaking him. That's disgusting. What's also good with that is the fact that Luge or that plus 2,000 will help Lednar survive through power loss as well because you find it's not too hard to make it uh, power loss around 8k or 9k, especially with something like Leviathan these days. But ultimately, making him a 10k with Brave, so he can just keep on attacking and also sit there blocking as well, is incredibly powerful. Chocobo! Choose one forward you control, return to its owner's hand, draw one card. So ultimately, you could have let Lednar there, your opponent discards two cards, Lednar loses, a bit, uh, loses his uh, counter, they then do something to try and kill Lednar, you Chocobo him back to your hand, they've just wasted probably at least three cards from their hand, which is really good to be honest. You can then obviously replay Lednar back onto the field, and he'll gain those counters, so yeah, just horrible for your opponent to come up against. Not to mention the fact that you get Lednar back to hand, and also Chocobo gets you another card to hand as well, so your opponent loses cards whilst you keep loads in hand. Ultimecia. So really this is just about freezing all your opponent's backups. I mean, if you freeze all their backups, that means that they're probably not going to want to use the seat or their cards in hand to get rid of Lednar because they need to use those to actually be able to play things onto the field. Otherwise, Lednar is going to run rampant. Um, obviously, Lednar will run rampant anyway because, you know, he can't be broken. But if they can at least play blockers, and fair enough, and they can try and wait out a turn when Ultimis or when their backups are reactivated. Carbuncle, similar sort of thing. You can kind of goad your opponent into discarding cards from hand because that's what they have to do. Full Lednar, and then once their cards go down, you cast Carbuncle because you know it's uh, yeah, where is it? As if your opponent has two cards or less in their hand, select two of the three following actions instead. So they discard two cards. All of a sudden, Carbuncle becomes a lot stronger. And finally, Sefi. So you can. Do use this in one of two ways. You can use Turbo Discard to stop your opponent from having cards, uh, so they just can't discard four Lednar, but also you can punish them for discarding four Lednar. So say they have four cards in the hand, they discard two to try and get rid of Lednar, you can then play Sefi to make them discard those final two that they had in hand. Now they've got nothing. Goblin. So I don't have a huge amount of combos for this little guy, but there are some fun things you can do with him. So at the end of each of your turns, place one monster counter on Goblin. Put Goblin into the break zone and choose one dull forward, deal at 2,000 damage for each monster counter placed on Goblin. So something like Naja Salahim, funnily enough, is pretty decent because obviously you get to double the counters on Goblin. So after two turns, that would gain, you know, four counters, which is really, or you wouldn't gain four counters, it would go to four counters, sorry, um, provided Naja Salahim can deal damage. But there's some fun trickery here. 
here. But let's say you've had Goblin on the field for a turn, so it's gained one counter. So what you can do is attack with Narja, eh, attack with Narja Salahim, and then on the stack you can dull Gastalian Empire Sid, which will increase the counters on Goblin by one. So it now has two counters. You can use Nono's proc from Narja Salahim attacking to reactivate Gastalian Empire Sid and give Goblin another counter. He's now on three, and then hopefully Narja Salahim goes through, deals a point of damage to your opponent, and now Goblin has gone from one counter to six, which means that obviously you can now deal 12k to a four that is dull. If you want to throw Snow, back up Snow into the mix as well, so when Narja Salahim attacks, he actually dulls a four out of the way. That then means that you have, you know, 12k something that was previously just standing up. That's horrible and hilarious. VV. So when VV enters field, choose one forty opponent controls. Deal it two thousand damage. If you control four or more category nine characters, deal it seven thousand damage instead. If you control seven or more nine characters, deal it ten thousand damage instead. I think you will struggle to get to seven nine characters in Fire Ice, um, but you can definitely get to four. And also remember that VV does include himself as well. So you could probably have something like Goblin, Kuja, Black Waltz, and VV and Bibu deal 7k and then if it's also a dull forward you can put goblin into the break zone to finish it off and make it 9 or you know 11 anywhere up from that point and finally kafka because goblin's only a one cp monster so if you can make him a forward and attack as well and get some value out of it that way that's pretty decent combining that with the likes of snow again would be good because you can um make goblin a forward attack with him, dull out that forward, deal opponent to your opponent's damage, and then put Goblin into the break zone to then um, deal however much Goblin has on him to that forward that he dulled out. Finally, we have Garnet from Opus 11. She's a 4 CP 8k water forward with the text, when you cast a summon, place one summon counter on Garnet. Remove one summon counter from Garnet, choose one forward you control against plus 2,000 power until the end of the turn, and then dull, randomly reveal one card from your hand. If it is a summon, you may cast it without paying the cost. So that last dull ability, you can have a lot of fun with that, but you have to be in the right situation. Um, and then her uh, counter ability is fine, I wouldn't say it's anything to write home about, a kind of an alternate version of the Opus 3 Garnet card, um, but fine all the same. So, something like Iodalus, so you can use Iodalus to cast a summon from your break zone, so your opponent might completely forget about it, you use Iodalus, that summon can resolve, but also that means Garnet gains a counter as well, which you can then combo in whatever way you see fit as well. Ramur, Lord of Leaven, how do you say it? I actually think I pronounce it more Ramu, but Ramur, Ramu, it's a weird one. Um, if you have two or more lightning summons in your break zone, he gains haste, which is decent. And with Garnet, you're probably going to be running lots of summons. But also, Ran Rammer, Lord of Levin, or your lightning summons still damage to a forward, break it. I'm pretty sure everyone thought of the same summon when this card came out. And that is the little 1 CP Raiden, which deals, I think, a 1,000 damage to all the active forwards your opponent controls. So with this dude, we'll just break all the active forwards your opponent controls, um, provided they can take damage. Um, but ultimately... Um, yeah, being able to put that or break all the forwards in your opponent controls using something like Lord of Leaven and also giving power buffs to Garnet is really decent. Not to mention the fact that you can also use Garnet's ability to just play a Lightning Summon from hand as well. Yuna! So this is a fun little card with Garnet. So, the cost required to cast your summons can be paid with CP of any element, so that's pretty decent. But also, when Yuna enters the field, you may pay 3 Wind and 2 Colorless. When you do so, search for up to six summons, each of different element and cost, and add them to your hand. And then obviously you've got the double cast S, which is when you cast a summon this turn, you may cast one summon from your hand with a cost inferior to that of the summon cast without paying its cost. You can see where I'm going with this, using Yuna's ability to search six summons alongside Garnet's ability to randomly play a summon from hand. Now, what summons would I go for? Well, they have to be of different costs and they have to be of different elements, so you need to be mindful of that. Um, I'm going to run through one oh, summons from 1 CP to 10 CP. Obviously, they aren't all, or they're not all of different elements. There are going to be some that share an element, but of the CP value of that summon, these are the ones that I think I would pick, and I'll explain my reasoning why. So, Asura, 
because it chews up to two forwards, activate them. So basically Garnet revealing something like a Sura is a bit crap because dulling a forward to play a one CP summon isn't great. Obviously it might be the thing you're looking for if you want to activate all your backups or choose a character card with two or less in your hand, add it to your hand, uh, in your break zone, sorry, add it to your hand. But ultimately using a Sura to just reactivate Garnet to use Garnet's ability again is fine. And casting a Sura will have given Garnet um, a counter anyway. Barry, same reason, you can reactivate Garnet, but also you get a card to hand, which may not be a good thing because now you have a card in hand that isn't a summon, and by casting, or by using Yuna's ability when she enters, you get six summons to hand, but the chances are you probably, well, the idea is that you use all the cards from your hand to be able to cast Yuna and use her ability, so you don't leave yourself with anything other than summons in your hand. But yeah, Barry can reactivate Garnet to replay her again, and ultimately draw you a card. If it's another summon, great. Leviathan, draw two cards, then put one card from the hand, uh, put one card from your hand on the top or bottom of your deck. So you might look at those cards and be like, nah, they're not great, and mill one to the bottom of your deck. Or you can have a summon where you're like, this is a really good EX, put it on top of your deck, ready for your opponent to take or uh, to deal the opponent damage next turn. Shiva, so you can only cast Shiva during your turn, but that's fine because if you've played Yuna, chances are it's your turn. Um, but choose up to three folds of monsters your opponent controls, dull them and freeze them. So, I mean, this card hasn't seen much play for a while now, but it's still a decent card. One of the reasons I've picked this card, and one of the reasons I've picked many of these, is because they're probably the most applicable for when you're using Garnet's ability. Because if you're randomly revealing a summon, it needs to be something that's generally good. Um, so, you know, just dulling and freezing up to three forwards on monsters your opponent controls is really good. Um, the one limitation, obviously, is that it has to be in your turn, but again, that's fine. With any of these summons or any of these abilities, um, you need to be mindful of when you're casting them and really what the outcome is, but yeah, I'm just going for generally, well, generally good summons. Casting something like the 4CP Alexander to break a board of, or for character of uh, 4CP or more is good, but again, that's more restrictive because your opponent actually has to have a character of 4CP or more to be able to break it. That's why I've gone for something like Shiva. Diabolus, because again, just generally really good. You can reactivate all your backups and all your forwards if you want to. Not to mention you can also break a forward of five or more, or just a forward of four or less is set to a thousand power. Remora. So, if you use Yuna's ability, get six summons to hand, and use Garnet, and then you reveal Remora, not to mention the fact that Remora gets you a card to hand, that means you already will have five cards in hand, um, and that's just from Yuna's ability. So, with the card Remora gets to your hand, you actually now have six cards in hand, so that's minus 12,000, 12,000? Yeah, 12,000, sorry. Uh, 12,000 power to a forward. I'm pretty sure nothing is surviving that, not to mention the fact that you might actually have other cards in your hand as well. It's at this point that your selection of summons become somewhat more limited, but that doesn't mean they're any worse. Just something like Zodiac, obviously it deals your opponent damage, but if it breaks all the forwards your opponent controls, that's pretty good. Now, you need to be careful because if you are on four points of damage and you break three forwards, you're taking three points of damage, which means it's game over for you. So maybe casting Zodiac from Garnet randomly isn't the best play in the world, but if you haven't taken much damage and your opponent has a couple of forwards and you just want to remove them, Zodiac may be the way to go. Medin, similar sort of thing. So you can only cast Medin during your turn, just like Shiva. Uh, but if you have cost five, oh, that doesn't matter. But uh, ultimately, it's still 9,000 damage to all forwards. That means your forwards as well. So that means Yuna, Garnet, they'll die. But because you're casting summons, and hopefully you've cast a couple and reactivated Garnet, Garnet should have a couple of counters on her, which means that she can actually put those counters, you know, you can cast Medine, and then on the stack, because you've cast it, Garnet will have gained a counter, you can then use that counter on Yuna, Garnet, while the forwards you have, to mean that hopefully they should survive. You've got Raiden, so choose up to two forwards, Bennett Controls, remove the first, and just break the second. Um... To be honest, there are some, I would consider better summons now for much less 9 CP, but that doesn't mean that it's a bad summon. Ultimately, it can remove literally any forward from the game. Doesn't matter how, if it has to target or be cancelled, whatever, it can ultimately target anything and remove it, which is really, really strong. And finally, we've got Ark. Um, all the forwards lose 8,000 power until the end of the turn. Draw one card for each forward whose power became zero or less due to the previous effect. So if Yuna and Garnet do die, at least you get cards to hand. Not to mention the fact that your opponent's forwards have died as well. But again, like I said with um, uh, Medin, uh, you can use Garnet's ability to put counters on forwards so that they don't die to Ark's ability or Ark's effect. 
Sophie, for each, uh, I mean, we all know what Sophie does, I don't need to tell you that, but ultimately, having Garnet there to be able to buff Sophie when you want to, means that Sophie will deal a point of damage. So you could have just Garnet and have cast a couple of summons, maybe a summon that's buffed Sophie. Um, you can then put a counter onto Sophie and Sophie becomes 10k, deals your opponent a point of damage and you get to draw a card at the end of the turn. Ramza, similar sort of thing. You can make Ramza a 10,000 power forward pretty easily. Say you've got Garnet and one other forward on the field. Ramza only costs four CP, comes in as an 8K. You can then put one counter from Garnet onto Ramza. He's now a 10K with haste and can break a forward of three CP or less. Uh, Black Mage, so, you know, cast a summon, but because you use Black Mage's ability, that summon comes back to hand, but Garnet will still gain the counter for that. And then you can cast a summon again, if it's a particularly good one. And then Garnet will gain a second counter. And finally, Graviton, because Graviton is great. You can cast an Earth Summon and choose one forward you control. It gains plus 2,000 power until the end of the turn. And with Garnet as well, that also gives you another counter, which you can then put on a forward as well to buff it. So you can buff two separate forwards, or if you want, you can just cast an Earth Summon and use Graviton and Garnet to buff Sophie so she becomes a 10 gay and deal the opponent point of damage, because why not? That's fun, right? And that wraps it up for episode 58 of the Card Combo Show. Let me know what you guys think. Thank you so much for watching. It really means a, a lot to me. Um, we're catching up on the videos now. More Let's Plays, more card stuff. I hope you guys enjoy it. And see you in the next video. Bye.